Okay, so previously, oh, pardon me. Um, I want to get our heads back in the space. I suppose the fact that you've spent a, a couple of days thinking about other things, just like I have, uh, is a perfect reason to have a look at this. So leave space for heading because it's a bit of a spoiler. What have we looked at? Think right to the beginning of our current extension two sort of um, topic. What have we been looking at in polynomials? Can someone give me some like dot points? Okay, so I'm going to put that in. Yeah, okay, I'm going to chuck it in here. Uh, roots and coefficients, maybe. You, we've, we've looked at them. Uh, the results. Okay, what else have we looked at? Uh, multiplicity of roots. Um, just rewinding a little bit, um, before we looked at those, we also looked at the fact that because as Extension 2 students, we have a broader field of understanding for what numbers are, we've looked at different kinds of polynomials, right? What kinds? Real and imaginary. Yeah, very good. So I would say um, complex coefficients and complex roots, which um, go with that. So that's when we had a look in more detail and proved the complex conjugate root theorem, right? Okay, that's a pretty good start. What's the most recent thing that we have looked at? What do you remember? Mm. Something in common with trigonometry that we've, we've seen before? Starts with an I. We looked at polynomial, all I can think of is polynomial Yates. No, <laughs> polynomial identities. Do you remember that? We looked at those recently. Um, and just like when we learned trigonometric identities, polynomial identities were this tool that we used, like just rephrasing the question. That's all you're doing, right? You're like dressing up the same question in different clothes. Very powerful tool for being able to help us solve things, right? Now, we are going to pick right up from this guy here, polynomial identities. And rather than show how you can use them to make solving an equation easier, do you remember how we turned a, qu a quartic into a quadratic using a particular polynomial identity? Today, rather than focus on equations, we're going to focus on something else that is made easier by polynomial identities. But I don't want to tell you what it is yet, because it's a spoiler. So, to get there, I want you to consider uh, this little expression, okay? Consider. And um, here is the expression that I've got. I think that's the one I have. Okay, excellent. So, what does this have to do with anything? Well, it'll emerge as we start going through it. You have a look at this. This is a pair of fractions. And if you saw this on like a year eight or year nine test, okay, probably the first thing you would do is say, that's two fractions. I am going to put them together into one. That would be simplifying, right? So just humor me for a minute and let, let's go ahead and do that. So if I combine these two, I, I need a common denominator. What will my common denominator be? X minus one. It's just the product of those. So I'm going to have this on the denominator. And then in order to put them together, I'm going to have to modify these numerators so they fit on my new denominator. Okay. So it looks like I'm going to have two of these and four of these. You happy with that? All looking good? Okay, so let me just tidy this up a little bit. Um, up on my numerator, it seems like I'm going to have um, 2x plus 4x, which is 6x. Come in. Good morning, take a seat. Uh, 2x plus 4x is 6x. What constant term have I got? Plus 2. Plus 2, because I've got 6 minus 4, so 6x plus 2. And um, just for the sake of it, because it will help me later on, I'm going to go ahead and expand this. I'm not going to do it as a pair of binomials. Come on, it's going to be a quadratic, so I think it adds to, well yeah of course, it's, it's modic. It starts with x squared. The coefficient of x will be plus 2, because it, it's the sum. And then the constant term will be negative 3, because it's the product. Okay, happy times. That's all fine. Now, Can yes? <laughs> I think that's as good no, as it gets. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's as good as it gets. Okay, unless I, you know, go home, you're dry. Okay, now, what have we done here? Just having a look at the first line and the last line. Okay, good morning. What I've done is, if you think about this in reverse, if you play it in reverse order, right, what you've done is you've got one fraction and you can express it as two parts, right? Two other fractions, okay? So because these two, I need a new color. Because these two fractions up here are each a part of this one fraction, right? We give them a name based on the fact that they are both fractions. 
and they form a part, they form parts of the original. We call these guys partial fractions. Partial fractions, right? So that's kind of okay. Whoopee for you, you've made a new name, you've done you can, you've called this something, all right? Um, why is that useful? We'll get to that in a second, okay? What I want to ask though is, like this was easy to do. As we just said, like, oh, this is a very instinctive thing to do, to combine fractions together. That's simplifying, no problem. What if I wanted to go in the reverse order? What if I wanted to start with this and say, well, what original pair of fractions did you come from? What if I went in the opposite direction instead of combining? What if I were decomposing, right? Well, not if I were physically decomposing, but what if I were decomposing that, that's actually what we call it, decompose this into its partial fractions, okay? How would I go about doing this? Well, what I'm going to um, hypothesize is, let this thing here, right? Because I can see this denominator can be factorized, right? Without knowing too much about that, I can already see that that is the case, right? So what I'm going to hypothesize is, I'm going to introduce, good morning, an identity, right, equal and always equal to, some pair of fractions that has the two factors as the two denominators. It's got to come from something like that, right? So there's an x minus 1 and an x plus 3, okay? But if I'm starting from here, like this is what I know, and I, I don't, if I didn't know this from the beginning, right, at least for me, I don't immediately like, oh, what are these numbers? Like, how do I come up with them? I don't know what they are, so of course the superpower of algebra is to say, well, it doesn't matter if I don't know what they are. Let's just give them some names and see what we can conclude. A and B, I'm just going to say, yeah, they're, they're something that's constant. I don't know what they are yet. I'm going to try and find out. Okay. So if I've introduced this identity, how am I going to go about actually working out what the numbers are? Because we've done this all the time. We're like, express this in this form and find out what A and B and C and K are, whatever. What shall I do? Yeah. yeah. Want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Say it again. Okay, so I'm, I first I need to put these together, don't I? Now, the, one of the reasons why this is going to be helpful is just like in, say, auxiliary angle form for tree. Right? I hope you get that I'm trying to draw the parallels all the time. Okay? In auxiliary angle, what we want is both sides, r sine x plus alpha, you know, sine x plus cos x or whatever, we want them to look as similar as possible because what's the point of doing that? What happens if they're similar? Yeah. Then I can compare coefficients, right? Or real and imaginary parts, or whatever I'm doing, right? So if I get the denominators the same, that will be a really helpful step. Let's do it. This is equal and always equal to. Now, this is going to look just like this, right? Because I'm doing the same thing. I just don't know what the numerators are. So this is going to look just like this. And now, because I have gotten the common denominator, all I really need to worry about is the numerators, right? As Mark said, all I need to really do is shift this a little bit so I can compare the coefficients, right? So when you have a look at this, this is kind of factored out in a way that's inconvenient to me. I want to know what the x terms are, and I want to know what the constant terms are, yes? So let's have a look. How many x terms do I have? A plus B. I've got a plus b of the x's, right? So I'm going to factor that out, a plus b times the x's. And then when you have a look at the constants, I've got 3a there, uh, minus b there. So even though it's a little bit redundant, I'm going to put them in brackets anyway to indicate they're one thing. That's the constant term there. Uh, there are no other constant terms in the numerator, so that must constitute the entire thing. And of course, I've got my denominator down here. So now, I've done everything I need to put them into the right form. I'm going to now say by comparison of coefficients. And I've got two coefficients I need to compare. The x term, or the x to the 1 term, and the constant term, which is the x to the naught term. Okay? So you can see that guy there is equal and always equal to that. That guy there, equal and always equal to that. So let's go ahead with that. a plus b equals, what did we say? 6. Done. So you see, just like we've seen in so many situations, you can pair coefficients and that gives you a pair of simultaneous equations just like it did with the auxiliary angle. And we need to just go ahead and solve. What's the obvious thing to do in this particular pair? I'm going to add, which will eliminate out the b's from this. So when I go 1 
plus 2, that's just going to give me 4a equals 8, hence a equals 2, which we, because we crafted this question, we already knew that, but if you just took that away, you, there's nothing that obviously says to you, oh, of course it's 2, right? We had to sort of logic that out. And then, of course, if you take that, I'm going to substitute that back into 1, and that tells me right off the bat that b is equal to 4, as required, as we already knew. Okay? So this is this process of taking one fraction and decomposing it into partial fractions. Okay? Before I go on, anyone want to ask any questions? Okay, yes, we will get to all different kinds of cases of doing this. This is a pretty, well, it's about as simple as the cases I could have come up with, just so we can see the principle on how it works. Okay? So, uh, let's conclude down the bottom here. Okay? What I have just established is that 6x plus 2 it, on this denominator is equal to um, that pair of fractions. And I've done it without any prior knowledge or that without drawing any prior knowledge of what the actual partial fractions were. I did it from scratch, as it were. Like I knew nothing about what these would be and I worked it out. Okay. So, what's the point of doing that? What is it that just like before polynomial identities, they were useful for making equations easier to solve? What's the use of this? Yeah. Okay, so if I do this, suddenly, this somewhat arbitrary and esoteric, ooh, let's make one fraction into two. This kind of random sort of problem now unveils its real power, right? Because when you have a look at that first, the left-hand side, right? You look at this disaster, okay? What on earth do you do with that? You might think, ooh, it's okay, I'll take out a factor of two. You get 3x plus 1, which is completely useless to you. All we know to do with rational integrands like this is to search for an f dash on f. And there's no twisting and turning you can do to turn this into an f dash on f. It's, it's not going to happen, okay? So, if I can unravel, like the, the reason it's a problem is because this guy and this guy don't quite relate in the same way that I want it to. If I can decompose into a pair of fractions, this is trivial, like super trivial in fact. What's going to happen if I didn't have a 2 there, if I just have a 1, what will that integrate into? Log, log of x, x minus 1, except I've got two of them. So then I just say 2 log x minus 1. Okay. In exactly the same way, you have a look at this. It would integrate into log of x plus 3, but I've got four of them. So you're going to go like so. And because it's indefinite, of course, I'm going to say that. Okay. So you can see I have turned an otherwise insoluble problem. Like this is the kind of problem you look at and you're like, don't know how to do this, <laughs> right? With very simple skills, right? And the critical idea of the polynomial identity, which seems fairly innocuous really, but actually it's, um, it just reduces this question down to size. Okay, as extension two students, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, because, because if you were doing something with this guy or this guy, and you think about the domain of these functions, okay? The domain of these functions includes all kinds of weirdo negative values. So therefore I want to reflect that in the box. And we, we established why, in fact, you're actually doing two integrations at once when you've done this, um, because you're ending up at the positive log and the negative log at the same time because of the domain of these guys.